Hi friends, Tony DeWitt here, Missouri Appellate Attorney and a guy who likes to make the law make sense on YouTube. Here's what we're discussing today. The neat thing about being a defense attorney is that you get to do things that the prosecution can't do. As the defense attorney, you have one job, and that job is to create reasonable doubt. And you know what job you don't have? You don't have the job of having to admit any evidence. Unless you raise an affirmative defense, for example, uh, self-defense, in a self-defense case, you don't have any obligation to introduce evidence of any kind. In fact, you can sit back and do absolutely nothing and still prevail because the state has all the burdens of proof and persuasion in a criminal case. So they not only have to produce the evidence, the evidence has to be compelling, and it has to be persuasive, and it has to result in a verdict. And reasonable doubt is not always easy to create, but sometimes situations exist where you just have ample opportunity to score points on the issue of reasonable doubt. And that's because so many times investigations are conducted sloppily and haphazardly. I defended a man once in a sexual assault case where the prosecution came in and essentially besieged his house with a search warrant they took a quilt that his mother had made for him and cut it up because they claimed that it had certain stains on it and that they were going to taste, test that for DNA. Now, as things happened, I didn't wind up representing him at trial. I only represented him at that stage of the game. And one of the things that I told the police at the time was, look, you best not show the video of this search to one of your witnesses. You better keep it secret from them because... You know, that's, that's not right to refresh their recollection with video of the house. Well, of course, the cops didn't pay any attention to that. And what they didn't know is that when the issue initially arose and it looked like the police might in, get involved, I told that particular individual to go and repaint his bedroom, change out the furniture, put it in different places, and essentially create a different environment than would have been present at the supposed time that that witness was, you know, that that victim, if you want to call her that, was in the uh, environment. Well, they of course showed the video, and when the witness talked about the arrangement of the uh, room on cross-examination, she talked about the arrangement that was in the video. And then they were able to put up witnesses that essentially said, no, you know, as of the date that she complained about this, the house was arranged differently. We had different furniture in the bedroom. The, the bed was against a different wall. The walls were painted a different color at that time. And this witness obviously based her testimony on the video. And of course, that along with the fact that the guy didn't do anything... <laughs> which uh, there was no DNA. Interestingly enough, when um, at, on closing argument, the attorney, who was just marvelous, came in and said, you know, they talked about gathering all this evidence and gathering the DNA. Did they present to you any DNA? Gosh, they didn't. I wonder why that is. And, of course, the result was an acquittal, as it should have been. But in this particular case... We have a really good example here of an attack on the forensic evidence. Let's watch this first little bit. Good morning again. Good morning. Ms. Popple, so you testified earlier you all found 10 live rounds, and that was in the search that occurred approximately one month after the shooting. Is that right? Yes. So, again, you have no idea what happened in the month in which went by that you all weren't there to search, right? Correct. Now, State's Exhibit 4, you testified at the end, uh, you looked at that exhibit and told the jury where that box was on the card. Do you recall that? Yes. Now, it's also been your prior testimony, is it not, that you put that box back on the card 
from Benavides' vehicle. Is that right? No. Okay. Uh, was that box there before? Yes. Okay. So that wasn't one of the two boxes that were removed from Benavides' vehicle and put back on? Correct. Those were placed in a brown paper bag and secured in the seam. Now here the defense attorney is going to ask to get some exhibits admitted. Everybody agrees the exhibits can be admitted. And now he's going to talk with the witness. Okay, ma'am. First I've got defendant's cue. And I want to show you that picture. Oh, yeah. Ms. Popple, defendant's cue. Can you tell the jury what, what that photograph is? This was a photo of dummy ammunition that was located at PDQ. Now, when you say it was dummy ammunition, did you send these to the FBI lab? No, we did not. And did you actually uh, seize those and take them to the sheriff's office? No. So you took a picture and you uh, concluded they were dummies without getting lab confirmation. Is that right? Yes. For those of you playing along at home, that's not how CSI is supposed to work. CSI is supposed to take anything that could be related to the crime. It's supposed to test it. It's supposed to make certain of certain things. And if it doesn't, then that inures against the credibility of the investigation. If you attack the integrity of the investigation and the integrity of the people conducting the investigation, as unfair as that may seem to others, it is a proper way to raise reasonable doubt. And here, well, let's just say that the crime scene investigator here would never appear on the CBS television CS show CSI because she isn't doing it the way even Hollywood want it, would want it done. So the potential impact of that testimony is just this. If you didn't have it tested and you don't know what it is and you left it there and all you did was take a photo of it, how do you know that those were dummy rounds? Well, the answer, of course, is you don't know that they were dummy rounds. They could have been live rounds, and you just missed them. As a result of that, I think that it casts doubt on the prosecution's case. Now, is that going to be enough? Who knows? And, and I have to say, if she indeed did bring live rounds onto the set, and knowing that she had live rounds in the set didn't check that gun, she deserves every bad thing that happens to her. But... I don't think the state has gotten there, at least not yet. So now we have the opportunity to look at this issue that I raised earlier when we talked about the opening statements about the supposed cocaine in the baggie. Now let's watch a little bit of the state's direct exam on this topic. Were you present at the hotel uh, the evening of October 21st, 2021. Yes, ma'am. And at some point that evening, did you go to Ms. Gutierrez's hotel room? Yes. And why did you do that? Um, court, and I forget what his name was, but the set steward um, were in her hotel room and needed to go to the store to get something and did not want to leave her alone. So they called me and asked me to come up to her room. Okay. And did you do that? Yes, ma'am. Um, and did you stay with Ms. Gutierrez for a little while? Yes, ma'am. Um, and then at some point, did you leave? Yes. Um, did anything unusual happen when you left Ms. Gutierrez's room? Yes. She asked me if I could hold on to something for her. I said yes. She put it in my hand and I walked out as there was a knock on the door. And after you uh, left the room, did you look to see what she had placed in your hand? Yes. And can you describe, without making any assumptions about what it was, can you just describe what you saw in your hand? Yes. It was a clear Ziploc baggie with a green small Ziploc baggie inside. And there was powder inside the green baggie. What color was the powder? White. Um, if I want you to compare this to like a sugar packet. that you It was would... definitely not sugar. 
No, 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 okay. no. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> let, 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 let me get my look like sugar. Let anyway. me get my question out. Okay. Um, I want you. I'm, I want to. I want to have a discussion about how much was in the green. Okay. Part, and I want you to compare it to a sugar packet that you would open and put in coffee or tea. Okay. How many of those do you think it was? Maybe four or five. Okay. Um, and Ms. Smith, how old are you? I'm 50, 51. And when you were uh, a younger person, uh, did you have an opportunity to use the drug cocaine? Yes, ma'am. I'm a recovering addict. Um, are you familiar with what cocaine looks like? Yes, ma'am. Are you familiar with the way that cocaine is packaged? Yes, ma'am. Um, based on that experience, what did you believe to be in the bag? I believed it to be cocaine. And what did you do with it? I threw it in the hallway trash can before even going downstairs to my hotel room. And why did you throw it in the hallway trash can? Because like I said, I am a recovering addict. I can't first and foremost have it in my possession. And second, I was, I was really very offended and I didn't want anything to do with the situation anymore. Okay. Um, after, after October 21st um, uh, passes, uh, did you receive any text message communications from Ms. Gutierrez? Yes, and, several. And generally speaking, what were the what what was the theme of those messages? I want my stuff back. <laughs> um, other than the bag with, containing the green bag containing the white powder, other than that item. Did you have anything else that belonged to Ms. Gutierrez? No, ma'am. Um, did you bring this information to the attention of law enforcement? No, ma'am. Why not? Like I said, I didn't want to be involved in the situation if I didn't have to be. Now let's turn to the cross-examination conducted by Hannah's uh, defense counsel. Ms. Smith, good morning. Good morning. Now, ma'am, that night uh, when you went to Ms. Uh, Gutierrez Reed hotel room, you were called over and, and Ms. Gutierrez Reed was distraught, correct? Yes. Now, you were called over and there were, um, you could see she was visibly distraught, couldn't you? Yes. And didn't you say that you would stay with her that night, make sure she was okay? I said I would stay with her for a little bit, yes, until court and the steward came back. Okay. And at the time you left, had they gotten back? No. So before they got back, despite your word earlier, you left? Yes. So very subtly here, he's calling into question her character. You promised to do one thing, but then you didn't do it. So that's the first step. You, you sort of go after the witness personally and maybe put them off their back foot and try and keep them a little bit off balance as you go through a cross-examination. Um, didn't uh, the Ms. Gutierrez Reed also go to your room that night? No. Now this is interesting because usually attorneys won't ask a question they don't already know the answer to. So it could very well be that uh, Hannah Gutierrez Reed here is going to testify and will offer evidence that is in opposition to what um, uh, this particular witness has said. Hard to tell, but at any rate, it, it would appear that uh, there is a conflict there in the evidence, and either he made a mistake by asking that question, which he shouldn't have done if he didn't know, or he has a plan to deal with it later on. Now, your testimony is that the last time you used cocaine was approximately 20 years old. Is that right? Yes, sir. So that would have been, I think, 31 years ago? Yes. And since then, thankfully, you've been clean. Is that right? Yes, sir. So you have not seen that substance in 31 years. That's fair to say? No, that's not fair to say. Okay. I have seen it, just not used it. Okay. Now, you, you stated on direct examination that you believed it to be cocaine. Yes. And do you recall 
stating at one point that you said it could be cocaine or meth? Um, I don't recall saying that, no. Okay, do you recall at your pretrial interview being asked the question, what was in those baggies? Inside the green, well, inside the snack baggie was the green baggie. Inside the green baggie was a white powdery substance, which I knew to be cocaine, or I mean, it could have been meth or something, too. Another excellent job of creating doubt. She testified she thought it was cocaine or believed it to be cocaine, but then at, in an earlier point in time, she couldn't tell whether it was meth or cocaine or something else. So clearly it could have been something else. And he's doing a good job here of essentially calling into question her beliefs and her assumptions because she probably just assumed it was cocaine. And keep in mind, he doesn't have to prove it wasn't cocaine. The state has to prove that it was cocaine, and they are relying on the testimony of a 51-year-old former addict to do that who has already been shown to perhaps have broken her word and done other things. There are some serious issues with this testimony in terms of the state making its case that this was actually cocaine. And that's all he has to do here. He has to show that it's reasonable to doubt that it was cocaine. The, the alternate inference that you could create is by virtue of her having been a recovering addict, Maybe she decided to sample the goods. That may come out on, um, on closing argument. It's hard to tell. Um, and I mean no disrespect to the woman. I'm just saying if I was doing this and I had a suspicion, I would certainly raise it in closing argument where you know everything's fair. And that was my question. I'm just asking if you said it could have been meth too. Correct. So in reality, it could have been a number of other white powders. Would you agree with that? Sure. Uh, do you know what creatine looks like? No. Uh, protein powder? Mm, yes, because yeah. I work in craft services. Okay. Um, you know, we could go through a whole list of items, but there's a lot of white powder, powdered sugar, right? Mm-hmm. Is that yes. correct? Okay. So the reality is you have a belief, but you don't know for certain what was in that bag, do you? Correct. Now, that was never tested? No. And that was never provided to law enforcement? No. Once again, reiterating the point, it wasn't given over to the police. They never tested it. We are relying solely on your layman's observation of whether this is cocaine or not. And we don't know because you didn't give it to the police and you didn't even contact the police as you testified on direct. So again, pretty decent uh, a bit of impeachment there. But now we're going to get into the ability to observe. How long did you hold that baggie before you threw it in the trash? I didn't make it all the way down the hallway. So how many feet do you think that was that you walked? Uh, I don't even know how many feet the hallway is long. So, can you, I mean... Can you look at the courtroom and estimate just telling us? Um... Possibly to the distance of the gentleman in the blue suit. Okay, is he seated right at council here, table? Yes. So would you agree with me that's about 20, 25 feet? Sure. Okay. So you walked 20, 25 feet, and were you looking at that bag the whole time, or were you having it down by your side? At first it was down by my side, and then I, of course, raised my hand to look. Okay, now weren't you walking past some police officers too? Um... Men in uniform? Not sure whether they were police officers. That's a screw-up from this witness, as we're about to see. Well, what do the uniforms look like? Um, they could have been armed security. I did not see an actual badge, so I could not say for sure that they were police. They were men in uniform in either security or police. Wait a minute now. Somebody gives you what you didn't even look at in the room, right, to know what it was. You just, she handed it to you and you didn't even look at it. And you walk out into the hallway and you come across a couple of police officers or who you think might be police officers and you don't realize you're holding cocaine or what you think to be cocaine in your hand. If the cops are there, 
You could have easily looked at this and turned around and said, Hey, look what I've got. This gal just gave this to me in this room in here. But she didn't do that. This whole dissertation about how she came into possession of this is beginning to look kind of skeevy to me. But then again, what can I say? I have a suspicious mind. Well, do you recall uh, being asked the question, why didn't you just hand it back to her? And you said, because I didn't want to do anything in front of the police. On page 19 of your interview? Yes. So at that time at your interview, you indicated they were police. I indicated that I believed that they were police, yes. No, you didn't say believe. You said, because I didn't want to do anything in front of the police. So were they police or not? I don't know. So you walk down 25 feet, you look up at it, and then you throw it in the trash. Is that right? I looked at it and then waited for the trash can, of course. I didn't throw it on the floor or anything, so I did have to wait for the trash can to be there. Sure. So you, uh, in fairness, you probably had five seconds to look at this bag. Is that about right? Yes. So you had a five-second glance through a white baggie and a green baggie, uh, and you then based your conclusion on that. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay, at this point, the only thing the state has, it doesn't have the bag, it doesn't have either of the two baggies, it has an opinion by a lay witness who's not been certified as an expert and can't be certified as an expert because apparently she has drug convictions. Because you notice she said that she couldn't be in possession of that stuff. You now have her opinion only that this was cocaine. And heck, it could have been something else. We don't know. And as the defense attorney points out, it could have been powdered sugar. I doubt that people would carry a baggie of powdered sugar around. And yes, there is a substantial likelihood that it was cocaine. But a substantial likelihood doesn't get you there. The state has a burden to prove every relevant fact beyond a reasonable doubt. Here it is reasonable to doubt what was in that bag. The only person who has any recollection of it is this witness. And one of the other things that is really important to note here is that the state does not introduce the text messages. There are no text messages that essentially ask for my things back. Why is that? They've got all these other text messages that they put up, but not those text messages. Again, it is a perfect storm for creating reasonable doubt. And at this point, if I'm the defense attorney after this witness, I go to the court and I make a motion for a directed verdict on count two because they have failed in their burden of proof. They cannot prove that it was cocaine and they have not shown that it has any relationship, the existence of cocaine has any relationship whatsoever to the case itself. They have not shown in any way that she was intoxicated or compromised by some drug in her system at the time that the shooting occurred. And so this is all just dirty laundry that they are airing in front of the jury in order to make the jury dislike this defendant. Will it work? I don't know. But it looks really good to me that the defense has called this out. Now again, if you were really, really smart and you really wanted to have a future in Hollywood, you would stay away from the kinds of things that are suggested by the existence of asking somebody to throw this stuff away for you or take it and hold it for you. How dumb is that? If she'd actually returned it to her, we'd then, then she could have dropped a dime and the cops would have come and she would have been facing possession charges, and maybe possession with intent. Who knows? The long and short of all of this, however, is that the state has failed in its burden of proof on a key issue, and count two is going nowhere. That's my personal opinion. Your opinion may differ, and if it does, feel free to express that in the comments down below. Like, share, subscribe, you know, all those things we ask you to do, and if you have the opportunity today, do something nice for someone as long as it doesn't involve taking a baggie of white powder and holding it for them. That's probably not a smart thing to do. That's what I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching. And then, if you would, catch me down here at the beach again next time.
If you like this video, here are a few others you might try, and don't forget to subscribe. Have a terrific day, guys.